Uh, we will call the meeting to order. Fifth Regional School Committee, uh, welcome all. And um, we uh, begin as always with community comments and look for the large numbers of members of our committee, our community out there. <laughs> if you miss this meeting, you can make the next one, first Tuesday in December, we look for you then. Uh, we have uh, reports from our students. Oh. Amy and Rachel, uh, who wants to go first? <laughs> Go ahead, Amy. All right. So, recently we had the senior and junior town meetings. And for anyone that doesn't know what the town meetings are, are we um, get all of the kids from each grade into the auditorium, and we have a PowerPoint presentation with posing questions, saying, like, do you think there's any issues with Wi-Fi or um, cafeteria food, and then just general things about the school. And this is like the major opportunity for students to have their voice um, translated into like requests for improving the school. And um, after the freshman and sophomore meetings, I'll have a full compilation of all of the issues that, and concerns from students. But um, a few include things about parking and senior privilege. Um, there's always concerns about cafeteria food and introducing new um, menu items. And then also people want more ways to continue improving school spirit. Um, but always the Wi-Fi and laptop connection seems to be the most problematic. Um, so we have to work with the IT department to fix that. Um, also coming up through November 18th through the 22nd, we have Spirit Week, which is um, wildly popular at high school. And the charity we have decided on was the One Fund, which um, benefits the, all of the survivors of the um, Boston Marathon bombing. And I just have a quote from the website, and it says, at the request of Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick and Boston Mayor Thomas M. Menino, the One Fund Boston was formed to assist victims and families affected by the tragic events at the Boston Marathon on April 15th, 2013, and in the days that followed. So last year we raised um, $2,500 for um, birthday wishes, which benefited um, kids to have birthday parties who um, were less fortunate. And we made a lot of money for that, and we're hoping that the whole Boston Strong mentality will really drive kids to raise a lot of money. And then along with the charity part, each day is a different theme, and um, we count how many people in each grade dressed up. So the themes we have for this year are Pajama Day, USA Day, Wacky Wednesday, Color Day, and DS Pride Day. And on that Friday, the 22nd, we have a pep rally where we recognize the most spirited in each grade and the winning class. So whoever which grade have the most dressing up people and the most money also. So then um, a lot of students really enjoy Spirit Week and any form of improving school spirit. So we're thinking of maybe doing one in the spring and benefiting another charity because we would have difficulty deciding which charity to raise money for. And then looking ahead in December, we're running the annual holiday toy drive, which benefits the Home for Little Wanderers. And we um, collect gifts and each kid from Little Home for Wanderers um, makes a request for what gift they might like and then we set up a tree with each the name of each gift and the kid's name and we and then kids from our school can pick a gift and a child and give them that gift and it's a really great cause. So yeah that's all I have. Is there any questions? <laughs> well, thank you very much. Rachel. Uh, so before I begin, I'd just like to turn your attention to the wonderful art that we have displayed back there. <laughs> it's pretty great. So it's sixth and eighth grade students that we have up there right now. Currently, the sixth graders have been doing art that's based on the style of the Hopi Native Americans. So there's a cultural aspect to that. And then our eighth graders have been exploring color theory, which thanks to a grant from DSEF, they were able to use iPads to take pictures of and recolor their own images into complementary, triadic, and analogous color schemes. So 
does some pretty cool stuff if you haven't gotten a chance to look at that. I saw that lesson in action. It's, it was pretty yeah. awesome. Yeah. Very fun. And then October was a pretty great month at DSMS. We had some pretty exciting things going on. So just a couple of pilots that we had were the seventh grade had a field trip to Walden Pond that had both a science component and a liter literacy component. And also the eighth grade team leaders had a parent meeting to talk about both our citizen action groups, also known as CAGS, and the Washington DC trip that we're all very excited about in June. And then we also had a great night on October 25th, which uh, the high school group SAD hosted a social event for the sixth grade students. And then the student council hosted a Halloween dance for the sixth grade students, which everyone enjoyed very much. And also, we just kicked off our parent-teacher conferences on October 30th. That afternoon is when we started. And the next uh, set of conferences will be this Thursday, November 7th. And the sign-ups for the conferences were on uh, online this year. And we'd like to thank Positive for providing refreshments to our staff during those conferences. They were always very helpful to us. Some guidance events that have recently gone on. We had Minuteman Regional Vocational High School present to the 8th grade <coughs> students during H Block on October 29th. And the guidance department also had a 6th grade parent night on October 10th, which was very successful. We have one important date coming up, which is November 21st. That's going to be an 8th grade parent and guardian night hosted by John Smith. And then finally, in terms of extracurricular activities, as I said, the Student Council hosted that 7th and 8th grade Halloween dance, and SAD hosted the 6th grade event. Also, our Student Council is going to be conducting a canned food, food drive through the, the month of November, which we do every year, and hopefully that will be pretty successful. <coughs> and then also, Dara Johnson is finalizing the second quarter extracurricular activities list, and those brochures will be posted on the website, and also, we're pretty excited because there's going to be a robotics activity with this to the floor, which sounds very interesting, and that's what's going on. Thank you. Any questions? If I may, just um, in this Miami, thank you so much, and Rachel, great reports. Um, to the point about the Wi-Fi, I just would like to <laughs> emphasize that it seems like the topic that never goes away or turns on. Um, <laughs> we had a consultant actually on campus yesterday, and um, we will have that issue resolved, I'm told, by the interim director of technology within one week, um, and that whole system should be stabilized. So we brought in some external reinforcements <laughs> to make sure that that got back up and running. For you. And also, I just received a report from Mrs. Madden, the Director of Food Service, and she reports that there'll be another meeting coming up with students fairly soon. The last meeting, I guess, the topic revolved a lot around signage in the, in the cafeteria and making sure that students knew what was on the menu yeah. for the day, at, for both middle school and high school. Mm -hmm. So the next topic we're going to take a deep dive into will be the choices, menu choices. So that would be fun. Um, and I know the senior officers were talking to Mrs. Madden also yeah. about getting some form of a, like hot water so kids mm. can bring their own coffee or tea. And fill it up like, yeah. during break. And yeah. they said they were considering starting that this month. So that's a good time. That's, that's great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Terrific. Uh, next, I see on our agenda <coughs> subcommittees. Did, did you mean for a. We were just left from there weren't any. Oh, that's no, yeah. Okay. No uh, I mean, the ones mentioned in my report, the super ones of the wellness committee is mentioned in my report. On to central office and Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Robinson. would like to just recognize publicly the great work of Ms. Kim McParland as our assistant headmaster at the high school who retired um, at the end of October. We want to thank Kim for her 11 years with Dover Sherborne. Uh, she contributed immensely uh, to a lot of, of the great advancements at the high school. So we thank her for her years of service, and uh, she will be missed. Um, Ms. Lonergan has been brought in uh, under a contract to assist with some of the evaluations that will occur. And that was an extraordinary idea by Mr. Smith to have Ms. Lonergan, so they're quite a team. And uh, that's a, a terrific development on the high school front. I want to thank all regional school committee members who were part of the uh, return to school uh, at the end of October. We hope you enjoyed your day or days uh, with us here at the regional campus. As well, we'd like to just 
you know, over the past week and a half or so, it's, it's seen nonstop between an incredible fundraising event at the Twin Fields property in Dover a couple weekends ago, uh, sponsored by Positive, the DSCF Gala last Friday evening, the Jazz Brunch uh, this past Sunday at the Sherborne Inn, all of the athletic opportunities, uh, having Michael Haynes on campus today for the social morning kickoff. It, it's just been an extraordinary whirlwind of a couple of weeks and just reinforces all the great, the great things that are going on in our school system. So thank you. I'd like to recognize all those groups and all of our athletic teams who every single team of uh, varsity team making postseason play and we're in the throes of all of the, the games even as we speak about exactly as we speak. Girls field hockey tomorrow afternoon. Four o'clock. What's that? Four o'clock. I'm just spelling the rumors. A North Shore fit. That's right, that's right. I've included in the packet a, a memo, actually. I thought it was an interesting follow-up from Stephen Hemmen, who's the executive director um, with MARS, the Mass Association of Regional Schools, and it speaks to the issue of the minimum local contribution. just wanted to make sure I provided that for you. I, I think it had been referenced last month, and I just wanted to make sure you actually had the, the memo from uh, Mr. Hemmen. On the topic of the intermunicipal agreement, um, there's an update included herein. I also uh, have copies of any of the needs of the October 4th memo that have been written to the Regional School Committee. And I've included some updates here for the consumption of the committee. In last conversation with Attorney Rick Manley, who's bond counsel for both towns, um, Attorney Manley has provided his opinion and his assertion that the intermunicipal agreement as authored uh, continues to be the viable tool to achieve the ends of both uh, towns in terms of um, either funding, that is to say borrowing for capital projects or funding them by way of cash if that were the desired outcome. At the meeting that we had in my office that involved Attorney Barbara St. Andre, Town Council Sherborne, Rick Manley, Bond Council, as well as Chris Haig, and Town Administrator David Williams that was held at the beginning of October, uh, it was desired that we provide a couple of prospectuses from various regional school districts that have used an intermunicipal agreement to achieve this particular end. And those um, documents are being reviewed by Attorney St. Andre, as well as a clean version of the intermunicipal, the IMA, the Intergovernmental Agreement, that Attorney Manley provided at the close of last week to me, and I in turn provided that to Attorney St. Andre for her review um, with Mr. Dorensis from the Sherborne Board of Selectmen. My understanding is they're meeting this week to review the clean IMA against the prospectuses that were provided and we await anxiously um, to see what the outcome of that meeting is. So we're supposed to report back to you. Mm -hmm. So what uh, regional districts have used an IMA? You looked in Massachusetts, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were, we had a whole, a whole list a whole of them, yeah, mm -hmm. a whole bunch. A lot, they're used widely across the Commonwealth. And then Mr. and Mr. Lee had asked at the last, asked the well, question. Well, I'm still yeah. confused. I would have thought the IMA would allow a town to issue bonds on behalf of a project that's being completed at a regional entity. Mm -hmm. And then the other town could choose to follow the same threat half or to pay cash or mm -hmm. whatever. So I would think that you'd want to see a prospectus issued by a town that participates in a region to fund to bond property that's owned by the region not a regional prospectus per se that's issued by a region i'll have to check and see and go back to because they were provided several weeks ago and see what we had actually sent off to them but i'll make sure we do that before they meet this week because so it's, it's not the yeah. point of us issuing debt or would we just issue let's say we did this and sure weren't one of the to bond and, and Dover didn't, would we just issue debt for 45% of the project roughly and build back? No, we wouldn't be doing, it wouldn't be anything done by no. the regional Okay, so, so it still needs to be a bond under the name of a town that references the, set, that right. references yeah. the, the, the legal mass general, you know, right. law in the prospectus that isn't the one that towns typically use that dictates the town owns the property. So we're looking for the town yeah. name and right. the town. So I thought you had gone back to Rick with that, that exact construction. I think we may have. Yeah, yeah. because, yeah. So, because yeah. the region so is So let's say Acton Boxborough would be right. under, bond under, issued under Acton or mm -hmm. under Boxborough. Right. 
The other issue, Michael, um, you had asked was could we also get opinion or could we have the attorneys opine on, the, on behalf of the actual underwriters for yeah. some of these projects? We asked that of Attorney Manley, uh, remember Chris, we asked that in the office, and he said those questions when they've been asked before have been diverted right back to, to Rick as bond counsel. So they never really yeah. step in, they sort of defer to his. To his, his opinion <laughs> that's embedded further on. And then to, to one of the other issues which Mr. Durant has had, which concerns the, um, the, the fear or the feeling that by having boards of select and sign off on the IMA that it's almost presupposes the vote of town meeting and he was uncomfortable with that. So in this clean version, Attorney Manley has authored language saying, by no means does this commit the town, this does not presuppose the vote of either town. Mm -hmm. um, so in his estimation, that should resolve that particular mm -hmm. issue as well. So, so Sherman will come back to you. I'm sorry, could you speak up a little bit? We can't hear Sorry, Kathy, I said okay. Sherman will come back to you and the next step will be. <laughs> um, Thank you. I, I, I would if, need to if they say yes or no. That I need to provide that back to the regional school committee. So you know, I guess one, one angle is, is there a desire on the part of the Sherman Board of Selectmen to put it to a vote? By the selectmen themselves um, to decide if that's actually the will of the board of the selectmen. Um, I don't know if they're inclined to do that or not, but they clearly have bond counsel that supports the authoring of the IMA and it feels that it's a sound legal document. So I'm not sure if the board of selectmen would be inclined to, to do that. Right. I just didn't know, Sue, whether you needed any consensus from us that should they say X, you can begin to go down. Well, I will also share that I reached out, as I indicated in my report, I reached out to uh, Representatives Garlick and, and Blinsky, had a conversation by cell phone the other afternoon with, with Dave Blinsky, and his feeling on that, on the issue, was that before he would introduce any special legislation around this particular topic, he would want that to come from a petition at town meeting. Um, he would literally want that before he would feel as if that was something he would want to sign his name to. Um, he, he echoed in, in the same vein that this is the vehicle that's, that's used by cities and towns across the country. Right, so we, we are, we're not going to go the legislation route. We're, right. we're pursuing still the town route. Um, we probably should explore uh, whether there is another creative alternative should we continue to have Sherman say they're not going to. And, and, uh, and I don't know what that is, mm -hmm. and it would be nice to hear from, from Rick if he has any smart ideas. Um, but, you know, at some point, <clears throat> we will have done all we can do, but, um, but there might be one, there might be something left to do. I think, I think we better explore that now because we are in the position <laughs> two months down the road that um, you know, we, will, we will shortly find ourselves um, out of time. Um, mm -hmm. So, so <clears throat> anyway, so we're moving one, forward as, as fast as we can. One more question from the meeting. Would, yeah. If that meeting, was it represented to, to Barbara St. Andre that the DOR is now neutral yes. on this topic and neither render a negative nor affirmative position? Okay. With, with sort of the, the caveat that by virtue of not uh, issuing any kind of a sort of cease and desist around the, the mechanism itself, one could reasonably, yes. there's a reasonableness test applied to it, one could reasonably deduce that it, it is the vehicle. That's a step forward than three years ago. Right. When she was at least given a verbal, my understanding is a verbal opinion that no, this wasn't an appropriate right. mechanism, which didn't I would, help. I will say that Attorney St. Andre has been uh, extremely uh, approachable yeah. and uh, has been wonderful with us on this thus far. But haven't other projects been um, bonded or financed by the two towns without regard to this particular issue? I mean, the school was built, uh, the addition was built, there have been all kinds of projects with both towns without this particular thorn. So what, what, um, what has been characteristic, as I understand it, of, of all projects to date is that the region has borrowed money 
and assess the towns for their share of it. The reason we're in a different, we're, we're trying to do something different now is to save one town, Dover, borrowing costs that they don't need to spend because they have cash in hand. So we're trying to find a way to accommodate that. And that's where, that's where our difficulty is. But I thought Paul's issue was that the school was not in Sherman, but that was part of the argument. And, and according to Attorney Manley, it's a moot issue. Yeah. We, you know, the, the region continues to own property independent of the two towns, regardless of which town it's in. Uh, you know, it, it's conceivable that the region could decide to acquire town, uh, decide to acquire property in Sherburne, or I suppose it's probably even possible in some other town. We're an independent legal entity. And so it shouldn't be a matter of which town mm. the property's in. That's the, that's what, mm. that's the, the opinions we're getting. Kathy. So, Steve, am I to understand that this clean copy of the agreement looks different than the prior copy? That it somehow got different wording in it? It does. So this, and I have copies here. I mean, if um, so, my but, only question is: Has that been forwarded also to the Dover Selectman for their review? Uh, we just got this on Friday, so I'll send that right off. That would be um, great. We were just trying to get it in order for Barbara to have that meeting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah. Uh, anything else on this before we move on? Thank you. Um, there's a section in the report on the, the wellness committee, and intertextually it does indicate that, that Mrs. Charico's uh, PowerPoint presentation was included in the packet. We actually did not include it. It's on the website. It was fairly um, lengthy and for the <coughs> interest of paper uh, preservation and uh, whatnot. So uh, we want to thank Mrs. Charico for being present and for preparing such an incredible PowerPoint um, for our October 21st Wellness Committee presentation. Um, she did a phenomenal job and has, I think, raised the awareness and more maybe than the awareness is some of the options and resources we have available to us as a um, school community in terms of addressing stress and anxiety among the student body. Our next wellness committee meeting just posted um, earlier this afternoon will be November, Monday, November the 25th, the Monday of Thanksgiving week. We also um, included in the packet um, an interesting article from the Atlantic Monthly. Thank you to some school committee members who forwarded that off to me as well. Uh, but drawing a nice parallel between the NAEP assessment and the TIMS assessment and the ranking and how where Massachusetts falls in terms of those international assessments um, often in the United States is characterized as underperforming against a lot of other countries and this does a nice job of, of focusing attention on where Massachusetts falls within those international assessments. We don't, we don't want to lose sight of reporting out on the PISA uh, results either. Those should be res, uh, released around December 3rd. Those, the uh, data is still embargoed. The data are still embargoed regarding the PISA results. Free one. Yeah. Um, yeah, Nate and Tim's and Pisa, these are all separate tests administered to the kids, plus MCAS. Yeah, they're very sporadically. Very sporadic. So, for instance, the, um, the Pisa results, to my knowledge, this was our first um, administration, and the test itself was first administered in the year 2000. It's administered um, triannually mm -hmm. to 15 year olds targeting math, science, and reading. Um, but yeah, Nate okay. is. So, I guess what, I'm, what, I'm, what prompts, it, prompts uh, my thoughts is there's an accumulation, of, no surprise to all of you guys, an accumulation of time lost in learning to the, this wellspring of, of mm -hmm. standardized testing. Do you have an idea how many days a, a year we're talking about, at high school and middle school? Well, for instance, this year we have none of, none of those assessments. Those are being, being none done. of those. So when we were asked to be a pilot district for the park assessment this year, when I researched that with Dr. LeDuc, we realized we were not even going to be privy to any uh, results, student results. So we summarily wrote to Dr. Chester at the PDS and said thanks, but no thanks. Uh, that would have been about five days of testing um, in, in its aggregate um, across the, all the schools. 
and we just opted out to the test. And, and some of these other tests that have been done, it's not every student in every grade. No. It's particular grades, particular, particular grades, subjects, certain yeah. subjects. Random sampling. Right. Does that mean that when the part is rolled out, we're going to lose five days over every year? I hope not. And actually, there's, right now, there's a movement to put a stay on, on literally the implementation of PARC. There's been this big alert that's been posted um, because people just across the Commonwealth in particular are raising real concerns on it. It was in the MASC bulletin yep. last month. Yep. So, so for instance, the Tim's is administered to fourth and eighth grade students. It was administered in 1995, 1999, 2003, 7, 11, and then will be administered again in 2015. Michael? The, the delay within just Massachusetts or, or broader in the country? I believe it's just, I've only read about Massachusetts. Have you read anything? The delay for the park? Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I haven't read anything uh, recently. Uh, Massachusetts? No. Yeah, okay. me either. But, but, but you're saying there is a, a <coughs> excuse me, a groundswell of mm. concern. Mm -hmm. Is that because you got a vehicle everyone understands and is confident in and and has the infrastructure to administer? Infrastru oh, mm -hmm. oh, so it's the infrastructure being a technology. Some or computer delivered tests. Some will be in the park pilot. Some would be um, pen and paper and all that would be computer based. Um, tech, we posted a, a bullet in there. The Tech Now has a, a newsletter uh, that they produce and the Golden Foundation for Excellence in Education is a wonderful opportunity. We've provided um, information regarding the criteria around the Golden Foundation for Excellence in Education Award, and it really is a very broad range of appeal for various stakeholders. And the, the lar one of the largest items on the report is really the SEVP application. We had chatted um, some time oh, ago. Steve, before you yeah. leave the room, so anyone can nominate yeah. people for that? Yeah. Is that what you're yes, telling us? absolutely. So, you can go right to the website, and it's really a nice award. We had the reception here at DS a few years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, when Harry Gold she was here, Harry Gold was here, and it was it was wonderful because you can recognize school nurses, part time yeah. teachers assistants, so parents, community groups, yeah. whoever can nominate. Yeah. Yeah. Teachers can nominate other teachers, administrators. Okay. Can nominate. Yeah. Great. And on the um, the student exchange visitor program application. Uh, so we began several weeks ago, and Dr. LaDuke has done a, a great job of picking up and running with the application. This would allow us to at least begin researching the admission of international students to Dover Sherborne Regional High School only, the 9 through 12 platform. This is what some neighboring districts have done of late, uh, including Hopkinton, for instance, uh, over the past few years has begun accepting international students under an F1 student visa program and this is a, a, a great opportunity for us in terms of not only our strategic plan goal around diversity but also as our enrollments begin to decline um, and it's a, a great opportunity to provide students from across the world with the world-class education that we provide and also to be able to um, charge our per people expenditure um, to international students who may decide or desire to come here and study. Um, it's a fantastic opportunity, but we, in Karen's, again, done such a great job with it, but we are at a crossroads with the application where now it, it involves the commission of some, the commitment of some money um, in order to move forward because they actually come out, they do a site study and make sure you're actually a bona fide high school. And, my concern, Steve, is this is the first we're hearing about it. Yeah. We don't have a lot of background information yeah. on what it would take. Yes, the money is not much money yeah. in the larger scheme of things. Um, how, how do we get more familiar with sure, what I this is? How, how, would a, a it well. how would a student be housed? Um, what are the time demands on the administrators? We know mm -hmm. that we have a lot going on, mm -hmm. so would this be one more thing? 
the, the CEVIS application is the first step where we, I actually have um, prepared the application process, which is uh, Dora Sherburn High School, and um, how many teachers do we have, what is the, um, how do we, um, what are our high school graduation requirements, all of those things. After that, we would start to look at, at um, companies that would help us to partner with international students. And there are several out there. Um, Steve and I met with one this summer. Um, there's others. There's one that in my previous district we used. And what they do is they go around the country, the world, recruiting international students to come to uh, Dover Sherburn. We would put a profile into their um, publication materials. Students would see that profile and think about whether they'd like to come here or not. That, that company could partner with us to also assist us in finding host families for those uh, students who would then live with those families um, and then we would provide the education during the school day. There is some work on the part of the high school as it comes to, first of all, assimilating international students. Um, in my former district, we assigned peer mentors. The guidance counselors are very much involved, as were the educators in the, the school, and um, just building that community for the international students. And the host families are very important to the success of the students. Um, in my former district, we started um, a semester program first, saw how that went, and then um, they were branching out to accept full-year students the following year. And, um, so it's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. We get students from all over the world, and um, we can determine what we'll do next. But the first process is to become certified to take F1 visas for students. And that's what the SEVP process asks us to do, which is the, um, it's, you know, $1,700 just to apply. And then the funding for the site that visit is additional to that, where um, Mr. Smith and I will have a lovely conversation with the person who comes in to do a review of all of the documents, and they look at every document. So how much does the site does it cost? 600. 600. It's, it's 655. How does, it, how does it differ from the AFS program that's in existence now, where we have a some number of AFS students every year? If that's it's just for a shortened period of time. Right. Correct. Yes. Um, this would be full throttle. No, AFS no, is AFS full, year. full school this year. This is also full, full tuition paying. Okay, so the difference is one is pay and one is not. Mm -hmm. This actually could be an interesting marriage. Mm -hmm. I mean, AFS right now, we've had some great parents buying the AFS program. Mm -hmm. There's real sort of change happening with the program, and they really seek to have an advisor who's stipended advisor through the school system attached to the program. That doesn't exist at the moment. Um, so we've been relying on the goodwill of some incredibly supportive parents mm -hmm. to help us with that. I know that John Smith, when he came in, has already had a few meetings with some of the parents who have been involved with AFS. So this would be an, an interesting, um, potential spin on the AFS program. Well, I know that AFS program they do a very good job of matching the kids to the families, matching the kids to the school so that we sort of get the best and the brightest, mm -hmm. I mean, which works out very nicely. Does this have that kind of um, screening process because I wonder what would happen if we got kids who couldn't do the work or we got kids who were not fluent in English kids, you know, there are all kinds right. of how does that affect ELL? Part of the application process is for students to take a secondary language English proficiency assessment and you'll set the bar high for their um, score on that assessment. Um, they also provide a writing sample, transcripts, and the district al is allowed to review all of that in conjunction if you do contract with an outside vendor. So you can do all of this yourself, um, find the families, do all of this I'm yourself. I'm just wondering so whether those itself. vendors are as good as, I mean, we know we have something that we know. Who has the final say, the vendor or? Uh, we do. We do, because we issue the F1, the visa, so we have the final say. But the, the vendor is really just trying to put all students in the right light, um, and then you review the applications collaboratively and determine who comes and who doesn't. Um, and they assist in the pairing of students with host families um, across Dover and Sherman. People who opt for this route, 
it's with the expectation that this may be a multiple year. No. Just a single year? It's a one year. So it's not it's not equivalent to kids that enroll at in, in St. Paul's or, or some of the private schools mm -hmm. who who expect to be there for full time and, and then graduate with that degree. Correct. And we would not offer a Dover Sherbin um, diploma. And they can come for any one of the four high school years? Yes. Well, that leads to another question, which has to do with are some of these kids, if they come in as seniors, yeah. going to need our help in terms of um, college placement? And will that put a strain on our guidance people? I know that some of the other districts with whom we've spoken, they have sometimes a part-time coordinator for the mm -hmm. program um, because they're, maybe they have so many students that it's warranted that or the implication for college, for college application. But typically you can also set the tuition rate such that the program clearly would be self-funding um, in terms of if we had to bring in reinforcements for human resources. So we set the tuition? Mm -hmm. Yes. And do you have any sense of how much money the screeners make on top of that? Just curious what gets charged out to an international student. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Probably a lot. I mean, one of my <coughs> previous appointments, I handled admissions for a private school in Connecticut, and I worked with, what, 18 different uh, companies, you know, worldwide in terms of student placement and recruitment. And a, a number of they, they do receive a fairly healthy commission. Mm -hmm. That is their business. And would we see AFS going away or just as a different alternative? I think this would really be a, a nice way to sort of expand to that in, a bit, um, in, in potentially a big way. Sure. So can we just, um, Claire had asked, how did this come about? Was it that Karen, uh, you helped Natick bring it in and Hopkinton already had it. So what track record have they had in terms of um, number of students they've had and length of time and what they see as a benefit and what they see as a strain. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, for Natick, it was, it was extremely successful. There were eight students who did a semester uh, from January to June. And since I left, I don't know how many, but it continued. Uh, we based our model on Hopkinton's, which um, Steve has mentioned, very successful. They have students that they turn away. Uh, there are so many who wish to enroll because they would only like to accept so many um, mm -hmm. as it pertains to the grade levels at the high school. And Hopkins Genetic, in one instance in its history now, mm -hmm. Hopkins has been doing this a few years where they had to ask a student to return to his country, mm -hmm. uh, return home mm -hmm. for disciplinary reasons, one out of their whole mm -hmm. so what, what caused us to think about this a little bit was actually through the Academic Excellence Committee mm -hmm. um, a year and a half ago or so, because what happened is Hopkinton, as a school district, started really popping up on a lot of test results, a lot of the rankings, and it prompted us to reach out to the then superintendent, the headmaster of Hopkinton High School, and they attributed uh, some of the success that they had in their rankings to the fact that they were accepting a more diverse student population and able to handpick um, students, and it also was revenue generating. So. Academic excellence that was brought up. It was then also discussed um, as a possible revenue generation, revenue generating source uh, mm -hmm. for the region. Uh, moving forward as enrollment declines. So they have to take so standardized tests? No. no. What was your question? Oh, do we have to take no. the standardized? So if you have a sophomore, do they take okay. no, grade and test? No, because conferring the diploma. So you don't have to reach a competency determination. It's not a graduation requirement. Sure. It, it, it sounds very exciting to bring some international students in. Um, I'm wondering, in terms of scheduling difficulties and the, and the fact that our numbers are higher now, can you handpick that you only get take ninth and tenth graders? Mm -hmm. And is there a reason why we we would do this now as we're hitting such high numbers versus waiting a yeah. few years? We need to actually ramp up for it. So this just literally allows mm -hmm. us to kind of hit send on the bottom of the application to even get the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. uh, so it would be nice if we could do that initial stage and then bring back as we move through this bring back updates and and as we move through the process but we really wouldn't be able to accept for probably another year and a half exactly uh, that's how long the process takes so i guess that that sort of touches on my concern that um there are a lot of demands on all three districts and all three districts teachers administrators mm -hmm. at the moment and 
to add one more thing. <laughs> could tip that scale. <laughs> when, when you say add one more thing, what do you mean? Um, I mean these are students who presumably... No, 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 not the students. The, running, the running of the program, the managing of what's going to happen. AFS sends out a lot of emails looking for host families, and I believe we have three students this year? Three or four? Two. Two? Is it two? Yeah, it's two. Two. Um, and lots of emails went out and mm -hmm. calls were made to try and Fine. Yeah, so I'm concerned about the man-people power that it's going to take to pull this off now. Yeah. Um, so it's so, not really—it's not as much now right. as much as it is, you know, 18 months from now. When, uh, when truly, then we will, then all then we'll look, we'll, look, we'll begin to look different at the high school. At the ninth grade level. Yeah. Yeah. And at that point also, I would think that the administrators, faculty would be, I think that just intrinsically would be very interested, notwithstanding enrollment, in having a more diverse student population. Yeah, no, period. I, I don't. So I don't. There's great value of that all around. Mm -hmm. But I think the other side to that is when the enrollment does dec decline, it's a really interesting, you know, we were also charged with trying to say, okay, in addition to lowering expenses, what are some opportunities mm -hmm. right. for raising revenue for the region? Mm -hmm. This is an interesting mm -hmm. angle, and it's not a school choice kind of way mm -hmm. where you get a third of the cost of educating a child in the system. Realis we would get total cost plus yeah. whatever. Realistically, Check. though, you don't want ninth graders. <laughs> right, so it's, it's going to be a. a, a, a well, they don't want to come here. You're not, not a 14 year old is not going to go international to go to high school. They do. 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 But that's for four years. You're committed yeah, to we, you and I don't have to decide that. We're good people. Yeah. We're saying right. that. Um, so, so we're being asked it's to uh, pony up some money, and so one question, but don't answer yet because I have a couple of questions. One question is, where is this money coming from? Since it's not already in the budget, we're going to figure out where it's coming from. Another question is, I think, speaks to, to something Clara's mentioned, which is, it seems to me as though that the, the issue of placement of students, eventually when this thing is, is up and running, placement of students is probably going to be the most difficult part for us. We're going to get cream of the crop students from all over the world, but nonetheless, we have busy families who have to decide for a year or for a semester to put up students. And we need to be assured that, that that's practical. Yeah. And that it's practical for enough students to make this program worth it, because it doesn't sound as though we're going to be stopping at two or three. It sounds as though what you have in mind is a, is a larger number than that. So, Give me some assurance that those problems are solvable. Sure, I think it would actually be prudent for us to probably put out a, a survey monkey, and it would be interesting to survey the um, parent community to find out and to provide a little bit of background on what we're thinking about doing and what would their level of interest be in hosting for you know semester, year, here are the specifics around it. I think that would be very prudent to do that before we move much further down the road. Mm -hmm. um, because we wouldn't want to experience right. some right. of the very same issues that AFS. Right. Um, is, is, is there, and is AFS there a, is having those when we have the most number of students in the high school, right. the largest population of parents and families to choose from. Yeah. So when that population gets smaller. Is, is there a, an urgency to start this process? Um, that's, right what, now, that's what I was going to ask. Is, is this application good for some number of years so that if we do start it, but we're not ready for it for two and a half or three and a half years when that bubble really does start moving through? Or is it, is there a shelf time? I was asking shelf time? the opposite question, which is can we delay for a couple mm -hmm. of months while we test those, those waters? I mean, you know, when a particular person is going to say at a particular time, yes, I can take the kid next September. But if we, if we get responses that say we've got a lot of interest, we're good. If we get responses that, that look scary, then... That's fair. Yeah. I, I just... You're asking people to project two years down yeah. the road. So no, I, no. I even considered an AFS student. And then, uh, you know, I said, okay, so what's the fall look like? What's it, what's it? And decided, no. So if we're saying we're not going to do this till after the bubble moves through, you're asking people to project, yeah, that sounds good. I mean, I think you, mm, you would believe there's not much thought that, that you can happen. really put into it yeah. until you know what year and yeah. where your children are at and what's going on. It, it just I mean, seems like, I don't know that it'll be um, 
information that you can trust. Yeah. Well, as someone who has sort of thought about this myself, as, yeah. as you know, do I want to do this? I have to say that I would have a lot more confidence with an ASF student than with this other thing because ASF comes with it this security that that we all know about. I mean, there's a there's a comfort level. In, in, in their screening that we all know is very good, and we maybe know people who have done it and have had great experiences, this isn't that. Well, it doesn't well, stop other schools have used it. Yeah, that doesn't stop us. not having an issue in yeah. their programs. There's a year. You could have a testimonial, too, from other families. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yes. And it's a year-long yeah. approval process That's the, is the issue, so that it, if you make this decision, next spring to go forward with the application we're another year out before we're able to so it's it's whatever we decide yeah. i mean we probably we're really looking at you know we have 18 months worth mm -hmm. of still heightened enrollment I mean, at high school so that would get us through the entire safely without feeling like it was a, a rat race to get through the application process so and that's probably realistically what it would take mm -hmm. to really get to get it done I would like to hear more from people who have done it. I don't, you know. Have both of those districts moved to a full year program or are they still at the semester? Do you know? The Hopkins, I believe, is all full year. All four years in data because it's full year. Yeah, and I'd like to know what tuition they do charge. Because I, I don't think we should turn down a revenue generating mm -hmm. idea that is also so beneficial mm -hmm. to students and the school district. I, I agree with Claire that I'd like a little bit more information, but. Um, that would be one is what tuitions are they okay. charging and if we did do it you know we do we can start off as small as we want with two or three students for a semester as Karen suggesting uh, to start with one semester if it doesn't work let us know what does it mean if it doesn't work mm -hmm. how much money have we lost we could probably arrange I mean if it's if it's the little book committee we could probably arrange to have someone from Natick or Hopkinton who's involved in the program come in and offer some yeah or it, i mean it can be somewhere just send us some new york or connecticut or, or right it know. could be written it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be um, for, for the purposes of, of uh, uh either not ta taking vote or not taking vote this evening and then deciding when, when to take that vote um I, I just wonder whether i could ask each of you what is stopping you from saying yes at the moment is it the issue of how much money is it the issue of uh, how much money the application is is it the issue of of support within the community so if we, because it would be important to address those things quickly whatever we decide to do so maybe I could just hear quickly on those and then we can move on um, my I would be in favor my only concern is administrative time having someone on the other side of this exact situation I know how much time it is on their end to administer my child in, in house administration yeah. yeah so just what what stress that would have on our own systems beyond the, the classroom yeah it's, it's certainly not this twenty two hundred dollars that's stopping me I, I I don't have a problem with that I I would hate to see a ball get rolling that wasn't in our best interest and so I guess I would want to know more about if it doesn't work out are we out of money uh, you know do, do, do what are the, and, and also, I, I, I agree with you. I think that there is a, a big, it, 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 it's a stressor. It could be great. It may be completely worth it. Right. Um, I certainly see the benefits of it. <laughs> I, I'm comfortable moving forward. I mean, it, it, towns around us can be successful with this. I don't know why we couldn't, couldn't be, and, and certainly probably the biggest concern would be recruiting parents families to start hosting but that's that's what you bring to the table and get people energized around so i like the idea of foreign students coming here i think that's great um i do believe they'll probably be um, juniors and seniors i would like to know more about how the process works and um what you charge and how do you determine what families they stay with and all the things that will make the program a success um, if answered correctly and you know it's not the how the money that it takes to and the mm -hmm. process to fill in the application with the government that's just a process and a form um, and I think our t we're asking a lot of our teachers and our administrators at the moment 
um, you know, new evaluation systems, LBD, you know, the list goes on. And, um, and the high school's full. So three years from now, it might look like a totally different place and the right place for it to happen. Sure. Yeah, I'd like to know uh, a little bit more of uh, the surge of interest in this. Did it come from the administration? Is, is um, our teachers and uh, the buildings on the same page with it? And then the concerns that I said before. It, it's, it, it would be nice to do it well. So if there is initially you use the money to hire someone part time for a stipend mm -hmm. position, mm -hmm. is that doable with the money? Because I would like to do it well. Mm -hmm. um, my and my concerns are, are um, if this if this program is is, uh, is ultimately successful, then the twenty two hundred that's on the table at the moment is obviously peanuts. Um, without though answering those concerns, uh, it's not clear to me that we will end up pulling the trigger and actually pulling in students. And therefore, why spend twenty-two hundred dollars? I'd much rather have this group be behind it entirely before we decide to to spend sure. even a small amount of money. Um, and then, and then ultimately, I would want to make sure. I think it has benefits regardless of whether it pays, regardless of whether it, it brings in extra money. But I don't want us to be approving a program that we think is going to be a, a, a net gain and have it turn out to be. Uh, uh, you know, self-funding and no more. And because I think that the self-funding and no more is you take on all kinds of headaches and get all kinds of benefits, but there's no money benefit to it at all. And then you say, are these headaches worth this? I'd much rather know ahead of time whether in fact I'm going to be making that trade-off or whether I'm also going to be saying, if this runs the way it runs, it's going to be X thousand dollars a year. I mean, aside from the money, I think that even if it were a net zero gain, I mean, if it, the gain is measurable in so much else. I, I agree, David, but I want to make sure that we decide that it is valuable without there being a dollar figure attached to it, mm -hmm. if in fact that's what's going to happen. I don't want to say, this is a great program that's going to help our budget, and then not have it help the budget. I'd like to see yeah. those numbers. So we could increase the program we've already got if we weren't going to have a, a, a net gain, and there wouldn't be as much startup work. There wouldn't be as much work associated with it. And, and that may be true. So um, can we look at this again in sure. December? Is that too probably soon? not. No. No. I okay. would say probably later than December, given okay. everything else that's on. That's all. All right. So we'll come back to that when you guys are ready. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a lot that's been happening. You've mentioned the, the professional growth and evaluation system that's underway. All of the teachers have submitted their SMART goals. That deadline was October 31st. Great conversations around the craft of teaching and um, how we look at how do we know that students learned it through um, conversations about teaching and learning, so it's been great. On December 2nd, all of the administrators, including the department chairs, will get together for an afternoon just to talk about it, to look at some of the mini observations that have begun, compare some notes and see how, how things are going and uh, the feedback that we're giving to teachers. So it's, it's been a, a, a very comprehensive process, but one that's um, continuing and will continue throughout the school year. Um, professional development is um, on the horizon for the next um, uh, couple of months, especially the full day December 2nd professional development day. And I've listed a number of things that are happening that day. Our, our teachers will get together with a consultant, Pamela Barbezo, who will comes to us from Tufts University, correct, Mr. Bliss? Yes. Yes. Um, and Bridgewater State. And Bridgewater State, who will um, continue to work with our art educators on creating those, you know, on, on understanding by design units. The elementary um, teachers, all 95 of them, continue their course with Dr. Jerry Goldberg, a two-credit course that culminates in January. They'll be with him all day on December 2nd. Um, the high school edu uh, educators are working on the evening units, their di uh, district determined measures. 
And a select group of educators will continue to work on the language-based strategies with our consultants from learning. Now, the middle school educators will review writing strategies perfectly aligned with the middle school school improvement plan and the superintendent's goals. Um, look at response to intervention strategies and using our software Aspen to upload those um, UDB units um, and to develop teacher websites. And the K-12 nurses will work with our data uh, queen, I'll call her, mm -hmm. Ms. Mary Bronski, um, looking at Aspen and uploading uh, forms that go to the de de develop Department of Elementary and Secondary Education required forms for our nurses. So that's just sort of a snapshot of what's been happening with professional development. It's been my pleasure to walk through classrooms, to engage with educators, to see the students as they're learning, and, and to just join them in that great journey that is Dover Sherbert, so thank you. Uh, before we move on to um, <coughs> Chris Tang's report, uh, there was something in your uh, report on the opening of school survey, uh, which I just wanted to, to note if you haven't read it, it's just glowing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with, especially on communication and congratulations, mm -hmm. it just looks like a terrific um, initiative. Right? It's the team. Administrators. Well done, Gary. Mm -hmm. Very well done. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Day. Okay. The um, salary variance basically remains about the same. It's down slightly, about from 140 to 125. <coughs> I think that's a reflection of kind of budgeting during that 514 process, as well as um, some attrition that took place after the budget was actually enacted at the time because of retirement or um, people leaving the system. One of the biggest pieces of information that I'm trying to get my hands on and get the number finalized is where we were at with healthcare. We budgeted nine new, in fact, um, plans, um, an average of, I think, four and a half family and four, four, four um, individual plans for what we call qualifying events or people that retired where we, you know, have to pay their health care as well as the new person's health care. We exceeded that last year, and I'm really concerned we're exceeding that this year because there were a number of, well, 54 Changes. new hires. Changes. Not all in the region, but that's going to have an implication. One of the things we have to do, though, is get all the revenues in from uh, the retirees and the COBRA payments before I can get a better number. I'll have that in March. <coughs> Next month will include the year-to-date revenue report, food service um, participation, as well as revenues and student activity revenues. Um, November 1st is the second deadline for the capital and operating assessment um, that assessments that we have to calculate. We did a preliminary um, calculation. Um, it does look like the Sherborne share will be going up based on the current en enrollments. I'll know that number after we audit the number and go over it with uh, Steve for the next meeting. Facilities, we had um, a contract for electricity expired, expires December 1st. We went out to a, a broker uh, to get a bid. Um, they basically shopped the suppliers um, and we obtained, I think, a pretty reasonable rate compared to where we're at today. Um, I couldn't get a three-year bid without paying substantially higher, so we decided to go with a two-year lock-in. Uh, the total cost for the region will be approximately $11,000 based on the average com consumption of last year. This doesn't include the electricity cost for the HVAC. We have enough in the budget this year. Uh, I think that was in the budget um, notes. We knew that this contract was expiring. Our actual cost last year was lower. But we didn't decrease the line item because we had we had a contract renewing. FY15, I think we have to look at that and anticipate a, a, an increase. Um, the committee had asked for um, the state budget process. I provided the timetable mm -hmm. on that. Okay. Um, and good, the good news is the wastewater treatment plant. I'm so relieved. She's smiling. for September and October, and I think they were, we're on the right track. Even though it's more costly to have Weston and Samson, they're doing the job, um, and maybe we can get the AC, the, the ASOP, ACOP, ACOP released. So that's good news. And the HVAC project, we had a closeout meeting. 
I did get um, one change order request for 7,500. The original request was for 9,500. It was for electrical outlets um, that were not part of the original study that needed additional installing, electrical outlets and a piece of a, a roof um, ventilation system. Um, considering the fact that we had no contingency, that project came in on time, on mm -hmm. budget. Mm -hmm. 7,500 is not even mm -hmm. peanuts on 852. I, I really have to tell you the contractor was excellent. And he knew I had no contingency. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any Thank questions? You. Uh, Kathy. I was just curious to know um, if you anticipated a salary variance with Ms. McPartland's retirement. That, is that something that's likely going to happen in the budget, or do you have a plan to, to use those Correct. dollars? The position will remain vacant for the remainder of the school year. Okay. So we're reassigning some uh, tasks to different people um, that will, those people will need to be compensated for that, but we estimate realizing a, a favorable budget variance in that line. And that's exactly. not included in this 125 because it, it wasn't hasn't public yet. at the time. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. But you'll pick up retirement health care, yeah. too, so. Right. Not retirement. Not retirement. Not from an OPA. So. No. No, health care, but health care. Not yeah. pension. No, no. Yeah. Other questions for Chris? Well, Chris, I just have a couple things. On the, um, uh, on the, the balance sheet for, that you gave us, uh, first, I would like to note that legal service for school committee uh, budgeted at uh, 73000 um, we still have 90% of that budget in place. Let's see what we can do to just keep it going much further. <laughs> okay, that's one thing. Um, but down below where it says psychological services, um, currently also, currently o over budget, and we're hardly anywhere through the year. What's going on that, there? That's the encumbrance for the salary, the psychologist. Um, if you recall last year, um, one of them, the original person was on leave, and the person that actually took the job in FY4, or FY14 is at a much higher salary. So that's her entire salary encumbered for the full fiscal year. That's, okay. so that's, so that's a, part of my 125. So that's a fixed number. We're over budget in it. We're going to have to do some switching around, but it's not as though it's an out of control line. Correct. Okay. Okay. Any other, anything else? I didn't understand that. <laughs> We under budgeted. Under budgeted for, uh, we have a higher salaried person now, so that reflects, that's not going to increase from 26 to 54 to, it's, that's the amount for the whole year. Oh, we didn't have, we didn't have a person in that position. The person we had right. was at a much yeah. lower yeah. rate. Long term, long term. Long term, so. Right, right, right. Yeah. I remember that. Uh, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Moving on. Oh, that's me. Uh, moving on, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Robinson and uh, Mr. Bliss and members of the Regional School Committee. Um, would you like me to go through the highlights and, and save the two items for um, your review and approval to the end? Yes, please. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, as uh, Steve had mentioned, it's been a really busy, busy time at the high school. Um, last night we were um, welcomed with Michael Haynes coming for a social norming campaign. We had about 100 parents there last night, which was a great turnout considering we had a lot of uh, postseason tournament games going on as well. So a lot of parents were all over the state um, watching their sons and daughters play. Uh, Michael also came today to the high school, spent the entire day at the high school meeting with student uh, information groups, which was really very, very successful. Um, after school, Michael met with the full faculty and some members of uh, Scott and Brian's faculty as well who came over. Uh, which was fantastic, some members of guidance, and I think some other uh, support staff came over. And uh, Michael reviewed the social norming campaign for faculty, and they're really a critical component of this because they need to be the ones who really are helping to promote and advocate within the school. Uh, students really look up to the faculty, and it's a really a new perspective and a new way of looking at um, social issues, and in particular, adolescence and um, consumption of alcohol. So. After that meeting with the faculty uh, this afternoon, we had a final debriefing with Michael and members of SPAN DS. And uh, I just want to once again say what a fantastic job Bev Madden and uh, Mimi Creer have done and their entire social norming team 
it's really one of those situations where it truly takes a village and um, I think we have something really special here in this community in looking at the Social Norming campaign. We will continue the Social Norming campaign shortly after the um, holiday break with a number of marketing plans for students as part of the focus groups today, the students told us what types of things um, sell to them, what types of things are interesting to them. So Michael's going to be collecting that data and working with members of Span DS to um, begin a marketing campaign in the spring for our students. And really, we're looking at a multi-year multi plan uh, to obviously reduce and to create a more positive perception of really the great things that our kids are doing. And one thing I just wanted to point out to the Regional School Committee, um, the data that was collected from our October uh, surveys really pointed that uh, pointed out that our, our, many of our students are in fact doing the right things and making the right decisions. Uh, Michael had actually indicated that our data was some of the best that he had seen of any high schools in recent memory. Uh, Whalen, Weston, we had a number of schools in this area as well as schools outside of the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, and, and he said it's certainly something for us to be proud of. It's a, it's a place for us to work from, and we know that there are certainly are areas that we need to improve, uh, but we really are starting from a good place. Um, just quickly, one thing that um, I am um, heavily invested in is a senior greeter program. Uh, I have uh, brought a, uh, a woman in from uh, the town of Dover who is doing some work. I had the pleasure of attending a council and aging meeting in Sherburn. Uh, a couple weeks ago and have plans to also do the same in Dover. Uh, the Senior Greeter Program provides an opportunity for uh, seniors to come into our school. They help sign uh, vent vendors, parents, guests in, also help facilitate with the lunches that come in, which is <laughs> a big help for Mary Lasivita and Wendy Rand. Um, but well beyond just that, it really is helping to create a connection uh, amongst the community. I think that it's important for those community members to see the schools in action, to see our students in action, to see what their tax dollars are going towards. Uh, it creates really a, a great relationship amongst everybody. Uh, the one woman who is working there now absolutely loves it. She is a rock star when she comes in on Tuesday. She has her little uh, mints and candies and kids will stop by and introduce themselves and parents have now become accustomed to seeing her as have some of the vendors. So it really has created, I think, a welcoming um, environment to our high school and it's certainly something that uh, I'm very proud of and we hope to continue to have it grow so that eventually we can have coverage for good chunks of the day uh, throughout the week. And we on to some other things that are happening. Um, we had talked about uh, AFS. In fact, they are going to be having their um, annual gala on the 22nd, uh, Friday the 22nd. Um, and we're looking forward to having uh, 26 students coming from uh, various countries who are being hosted by high schools all throughout our Tri-Valley area as well as schools in Rhode Island and uh, Beth Benjamin deserves an awful lot of credit for that um, and her team for um, establishing and recruiting these students to come up to that evening. That evening will be hosted at the high school where there will be a, a talent portion, customs, uh, food, and it really is just a wonderful opportunity for us to, uh, to be exposed to diversity. In addition, they will be visiting the high school during the day and spending the day with our students and visiting a lot of our classrooms. And I know that a number of the students will be acting as um, guides and, and uh, assistants for them. So really, it's, it's a day that we're, we're really looking forward to. As um, I believe Rachel had mentioned, we have um, shifted our eighth grade parents night to Tuesday, December 10th. That will be for students who are currently eighth graders at the middle school who will be coming up to the high school next year. Um, I plan on addressing them as is Ellen Shagden, the interim director of guidance. And each of the department chairs will be there too to talk about courses, course expectations. I'll be talking about the cultural components of high school life. Um, and I've been working with Scott and Brian um, to make that transition as smooth and as positive as possible. Um, this past month, in terms of student recognition, we uh, welcomed a whole new bunch of uh, National Honor Society inductees. Um, Mr. Bliss and I attended that ceremony. It was a, a great evening, a fantastic evening, a lot of outstanding students. Um, a great uh, keynote speaker as well, who was, who was quite humorous. Uh, on Thursday, October 24th, the World Language Honor Society inducted a number of students, and 
the Mandarin program, Latin, Spanish, and French. Um, and that was also uh, a wonderful evening for our students and for our families. Just a couple other things to highlight. We sent uh, three educators to the MassQ conference, which is uh, the technology conference sponsored by MassQ, as well as the Massachusetts Superintendents Association. Lori Alighieri, who's a technology integration specialist, uh, Trish Uniak, and Alex Lenardi from our World Language Department, which attended uh, a number of sessions and really came back with some really interesting ideas that they will be also sharing with the full faculty at our December meeting, because today our meeting was with Michael Haynes and the social norming. So they will be uh, reporting out. And Lori is also working uh, with teachers to develop the uh, Twitter feeds for each of our teachers. So we're, we're certainly moving ahead in that direction. And just a couple other things. Let me put those all on your, oh, yeah. on your, <laughs> on your list. That's right. Um, you know, Guidance has done a tremendous job. They've been, as you can see, with all the different things that they have going on, uh, been heavily involved. Dr. LeDuc talked about the professional development that has been going on. Um, in addition to um, all of the work that is being done with DDMs, as well as with um, UBD and the new evaluation system, we continue to partner with um, Ann Larson from Landmark to develop language-based strategies for students. Um, and I'm something that I'm very, very interested in because it, it's so important that we're educating all of our children to the very best of our ability uh, and that we're educating kids in Dover and Sherborne and keeping them in our schools. Um, in terms of personnel, as Mr. Bliss had alluded to at the beginning of his particular program, I'd like to thank Ms. McFarland for her leadership uh, and her transition. As I came on this July, uh, Kim spent countless hours with me, sort of bringing me up to speed as to the DS way and DS culture, uh, and was one of the most organized uh, and efficient people that I've ever met. Um, when we went through the whole MCAS transition process, uh, she made it quite simple so that when we do um, allocate a couple different resources for that, we're going to be in good shape. So thank you to Kim. And uh, finally, in the area of athletics, um, very, very pleased to announce that the indoor track um, program looks as though it's definitely going to run. They were able to raise uh, over $8,000 through a number of different uh, coordinated events. So thank you to those parents for all of their fundraising. Um, the schedule has been complete. Uh, they are finishing up the round of coaching interviews, and we look forward to having indoor track this winter um, at DS. And uh, as uh, Mr. Bliss had said, we're also very excited uh, that all of our teams qualified for postseason play this fall, and that's a real tribute to the student athletes, <coughs> to the coaches, and to the parents who once again have complete support uh, of all of our programs, and it really was a, uh, an all-around successful fall. I have a question before we get to the, sure. the action items. Um, in the uh, school council notes, yes. uh, uh, toward the bottom it says, <clears throat> Mr. Bliss, uh, under courses, Mr. Bliss and Mr. Smith are working on allowing students to request particular classes that they're interested in in academic pursuits. Can you tell me what that means? Yeah, certainly. Uh, Mr. Bliss and I have been talking about opportunities for students where perhaps they would have some flexibility within their scheduling. We have graduation requirements, but to look at ways in which we can relax that a little bit with the current constraints of the schedule, with what we want to have for student needs and student interests. So for example, if it happened to be uh, an elective where we might give them the flexibility if they wanted to take an additional science and they wanted that to be their additional elective, that we would count that as one of the total for the 18 credits and we might actually then reduce the uh, fine performing arts requirements. Many of our kids are still going to choose those electives because they're very popular, they're very well run, but we wanted to really look at ways in which we can kind of almost uh, personalize a student schedule. And that's so that's something that as we enter um, the schedule season, which will be coming up very soon, we're going to be looking at those options. And Ms. Shagna and I will be working with Terry Luskin, who does some of the scheduling to see where those places have existed, where we've had those conflicts, and to then kind of take some strain off of students being pigeonholed into particular courses. Thank you. We we'll look forward to that, and, and I think we look forward to probably discussing it ourselves, because it's obviously something we had some, some friction on. Um, floor is yours again, sir. What's that? <laughs> next, next item on your agenda. Oh, the two requests, yes. Yeah. The first, um, is the New York City uh, immersion trip, which um, from my understanding, um, Mr. Uh, Martell has um, 
participated in in the past. Um, and it's a trip that he had vetted through me, uh, and I think that it, it, it um, certainly is very, very um, positive opportunity for our kids. It, the trip would be April 4th to the 6th. It would really only involve uh, students missing one day of class. They would travel to um, New York City, and they would have an opportunity to see um, a Broadway musical, uh, they would also then have some cultural opportunities the following day um, in Manhattan and to do a little uh, sightseeing and some touring. And then on Saturday evening, they would attend the uh, New York Philharmonic concert. Uh, and also with a pre-concert talk, Bob Martel was able to, in the past, has been able to secure uh, an opportunity for our students to talk to the performers and to talk to the conductors. Um, and really just an awesome opportunity for kids who are so passionate about music um, to have an opportunity to meet professionals in that field. And then um, on Sunday, they would um, have breakfast at the hotel and check out and arrive back uh, at the high school in the middle of the afternoon. Um, we're looking at having maximum of 50 students. Um, according to Bob, this has been something that they've done three times in the past six years. Uh, they're looking, um, they've got one particular show they're hoping to see and um, he's been talking to the students and they are very excited at the potential opportunity for this. Excellent. And, and we need a motion because, I mean, we need a vote because this is an open field trip. So if somebody wants to move, to come. I will make a motion to approve the cultural immersion excursion <coughs> to New York City for uh, April 4th to 6th, 2014. Second. 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 Any discussion? Um, just a question, how many chaperones go on the trip? They have, I think they're going to try to have a 12 to 1, is what he had said. So it would be about 4. Sounds like fun to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you might have a chaperone right here. Yeah. 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 Anything else? Um, uh, before we take this vote, and since this is the first vote of the evening and following a discussion that Amy and I had at the end of the last meeting, I don't think, I, I haven't seen anywhere that there's a requirement that it be recorded who moved and who seconded, only that it be moved and seconded. So, so the reason why we do that is if you amend the motion, the person who made the motion has to be the same person who amends the motion. <laughs> <laughs> I am That's trying to save we do that. Some, <laughs> some headaches here. Well, we won't do it on this vote. Uh, all those in favor? Uh, it's in there. Thank you very much. Oh, darn, I thought it was just so I could have my name in the minutes. Yeah. <laughs> it's the only way we can become yeah. famous. Thank you, Mr. Robinson, members yeah. of the Regional School Committee. Uh, the second uh, request for your consideration is a uh, donation of a shootaway basketball gun. Uh, what this basically is, and I've had the opportunity, being a former <laughs> basketball coach, to see it in action myself. It is a mechanism that allows for teams to practice their shooting and then it self-feeds the ball back to the various people who are shooting. So it helps to create a very efficient uh, system whereby students can um, have many more opportunities to shoot the ball. Balls aren't going all over the place, they're not bouncing off people's heads. Uh, it really is a, a nice tool um, to have and, and um, the boosters and the generosity of the boosters and Dover Shermore Youth Basketball have uh, generously offered to donate this machine. It would be used by um, both obviously the Boys and Girls Program as well as uh, the Youth Basketball Program. And I would ask for your consideration and approval of the shoot away. Okay. Go ahead. So moved. Uh, I move that we accept the donation of the shoot away basketball equipment. At a cost of fifty two hundred dollars from Dover Sherman Youth Basketball. From DS Boosters and Dover Sherman Youth Basketball. Second. Oh, right. So I was trying to get the same people so we could say that. Oh, well, <laughs> we've got so a second. So she can cut well. and paste. Any other discussion? So we get no video. Yeah. Just, I just I want to say wanna the thing I the thing I, it, no? I <laughs> love about this is that it's a joint effort between Boosters and the Youth Program, and we're, yeah. we're any opportunity we have to link up our high school programs yep. with our youth programs, I think is outstanding. So I think it's excellent that they're working together on this. I would agree. Uh, all those in favor? Uh, you may have Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. 
Um, I just wanted to let you know that our term first <coughs> ended yesterday. And as a long weekend gift, our report cards will be posted on the portal on Friday. <coughs> In, uh, Rachel alluded to it earlier, our Walden Pond trip. Mr. Marringer and I each uh, both got to experience that trip. And in your <coughs> packet, you should find some of the worksheets, the activities that they did, both for English and science. Mm -hmm. um, also, there's a link to poems that uh, Ms. Moy has, has put out there, if you have an opportunity to look at those. They're outstanding. Uh, Mr. Bliss uh, spoke of the positive Harvest Social, which was held at Twin Fields. I can't thank the Markin, Kristen Markin and her family for hosting it. It, it just a fabulous event and fabulous site. It was uh, fantastic. The gala was fantastic last Friday. Uh, parent conferences are going on. The feedback we got from last week was that they, the, uh, they were very well attended, very well run. People were very impressed with the electronic sign-ups. We have had some suggestions to even narrow the windows down more to keep people on, on time, but <laughs> the feedback was, was uh, fantastic. Our seventh and eighth grade math counts team is up and running, and our sixth grade math team is also up and going. The sixth grade staff, uh, under the direction of Maria Fiore, she's really taken the lead, has created four lessons that they will, they started last week on the early release day. They're going to take four of our early release days and, and use these lessons, and it's focusing on training the brain and, um, more importantly, on effort and how that impacts, that it translates into results. Seventh grade, uh, we also included a link in there. Uh, Ms. Raymond and Ms. Moy have a fantastic website. And their um, audio this month was on parent conferences and how those run. Um, this year we did, I, I don't know if I mentioned it before, the sixth grade had the same format as the seventh and eighth grade. And that was, folks were very receptive to that. Um, eighth grade, uh, Rachel had mentioned the Donna Bettigan and Kathy Malloy hosted a, a night for eighth grade parents explaining the CAGS program, and more important, the DC trip, which they're very, uh, eighth graders are very excited for. Uh, we still have to decide, Mr. Marringer and I, who's going. <laughs> <laughs> I might rethink. Uh, um, depends on the weather. <laughs> but, uh, guidance is, uh, yeah, it depends. If it's going to be hot like a few years ago, maybe I'll stay back. <laughs> um, guidance had a very successful parent night for sixth graders on October 10th. And they also have their uh, curriculum up and running. Um, PD, we had Sandra Samarco and Adam Muskovsky attended MassQ. And I would be remiss if I did not um, share with you, Adam Muskovsky has been fantastic in sharing with the faculty uh, in technology and moving us along. He created his own website. And he, from that, which is fantastic, uh, he created a template that he has shared with other staff members, and I believe there are close to a dozen staff members now who have, have taken his, and with his assistance, have, um, have some really fantastic sites. He also has helped us with uh, baseline edge training um, and, and shared how to upload information to evidence into baseline edge. So he's, uh, he's been wonderful in moving us along in technology. Uh, and Chris Gag mentioned before, the AC is installed. They are just tweaking, and I'm sure they'll be back in the spring when, when temperatures warm up. Um, and I also want to thank the uh, members of the school committee who came in and came back to school. And uh, we really enjoyed you being here, and we hope you found it worthwhile. If you want to come back again, or uh, you want to didn't make it, our doors are open. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe we do have one action item, which is a donation. Yes, Mr. Yes. Yes. Yep. Amount of seven thousand dollars to the middle school theater program. Extraordinary, uh, extraordinary donation, and uh, 
we have. Uh, Shall I move? Please. All right. Do I move that we accept the, the anonymous <coughs> donation of seven thousand dollars to be used exclusively by and for the DSMS theater program. Second. Second. Any. Uh, yeah, hi, Diggity. So, huh? <laughs> How neat is that? <laughs> Do we know how it's going to be used, or uh, uh, do we do, do we, we have, have some indication of what the? Not yet. I know he I, he has quite the production uh, going on right now. Yes, they do. Uh, and, and obviously, the, I mean, this is anonymous to us, which is entirely appropriate. Uh, I, I presume that the donor has some. Uh, communication with someone at school so that to make sure that the donor's wishes are actually going to be um, honored yeah, in that. Yes, there's, okay. there's definitely, Mr. Walker has been Great. in touch with the individual. Excellent. Okay. And the central office sent out a thank you letter. Excellent. 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 Awesome. Good. Thank okay. you. Any other uh, discussion? Well, on this, on this, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all those in favor of accepting this donation, <laughs> I to the Can we add hot diggity to the? Uh... <laughs> How do you spell that, Amy? <laughs> <laughs> it has to be in your motion. Okay. Can I amend my? No. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, I just wanted to point out at the end of your report, there's a, a wonderful picture of mm. students husking corn yes. uh, outside of the um, food services. Can they come to my house next? It's just <laughs> terrific to see. Thank you very much. Well, Thanks for getting them involved as well. Um, okay. Uh, thank you very much. I one. So is it in, in our council meeting we had, we talked about a different the more fuller version of a report card being published. Do you know if that, if you had a chance to look at that for first quarter or future quarters? I have not, but okay. we'll, we'll look before the end of the week. Yeah, we had a, a discussion at school council about, along with the report card, printing a progress report so parents would have a better idea of the breakdown of how the grades were arrived at. So it's, it's not creating anything new, but it allows, allows uh, parents so, so to see. So folks, so mid, at like mid-period, well, no, at mid-period, you always would get this detailed direction of assignments. And then for every quarterly reporting period, you just get a summary grade. And you don't see, like, did they keep submitting the homework? Did they blow a quiz? So half of the year, the first part of every quarter, you get this fairly detailed. It's already in there. It's not more work for teachers, right? I, that's what Presumably. we check on to see yeah. if the, the dates can be uh, But then, then at the quarter points, you don't see that information. And I think that also goes at the high school, right? Mm -hmm. Or is that different? It's the same. Doesn't Aspen provide, sort of provide that anyway? I mean, I know that it's not sent to the parents, but isn't Aspen essentially a an online grading book anyway and wouldn't it be possible to open pieces of that so that it didn't require more work on the part of the teachers if that was desired it's been so, discussion over the past couple of years about opening the grade book but we're not there yet yeah we we, we are not there to open well i didn't mean it's a a i meant it's a moment in time mm -hmm. i didn't mean mm -hmm. on an ongoing mm -hmm. basis i understand that one is mm -hmm. philosophical mm -hmm. but what i was talking about is if if the parents wanted to see what happened in that particular marking period after it was finished, that doesn't seem to be philosophical. Mm. It seems to maybe make it easier for the teachers because they won't be fielding emails. So, I don't know. Right, right. So the issue was raised <laughs> at the middle school oh, council bit. and it's in, you guys are looking at it. It was discussed at school council. Mm -hmm. so, so, yes. so would they have something there? Anything? Yeah. I going to leave this topic unless there's uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much um, uh, before we uh, go on to the next item which is a special items of new business uh, our packet at least the paper version of the packet has the extra mm -hmm. compensatory schedule and enrollment for uh, all the different um, high school, high school at least, and, uh, and the middle school as well thank yeah. you um, 
Was there something about this? Because I mean, well, yes. we've been talking about it for a long time, and mm -hmm. but I didn't see it on the agenda. I didn't see it. We wanted to provide it because there had been a request to sort of get a snapshot of what student membership is in each mm -hmm. of the individual extracurricular activities, yeah. and yeah. to see sort of in one fell swoop what's offered, who's advising it, mm -hmm. what the pay is commensurate with that, and then also on the third page in green appears all of the positions that remain vacant um, so that so that you know the budget of course is built on having all of these filled mm -hmm. so the fact that we have vacancies was <coughs> to the tune of fourteen thousand six hundred and fifty eight dollars worth of positions that are unfilled but the musicals will be filled because they'll run so yeah. And it, it's my understanding, Mr. Smith, that at the high school, there are other clubs and activities running that aren't even captured in this. Right? This, is an, this is literally this is, right from the contract This is what we for budget right. right. Yes, but there are many more. Yes. Right. Many more which are done not on budget. Correct. Right. 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 I um, understand that. They're volunteers. Right. So the, the ones that are vacant, uh, is this the first time that they're vacant? Do we have an understanding? Does someone go over and say, okay, so next year it should be up and running? Or I think it's is part this of when it's they just start the to see yeah. we, we need to? So the two musical ones is just because they haven't three. specified them There's for three. the year. And the the three of them, sorry. And the newspaper advisor, I would think that would be underway. It's, it's been two years without. Right. So, so I'm wondering when we're always turning down new stipend positions that newspaper advisor is $2,800 But I think there is one this year, yeah. No. There has been one that has been started up. It's small and it's a few students. Right. And it's not a newspaper. It's, it's not a newspaper? It's not a newspaper. My son is doing it. It's not a newspaper. It's, it's going to be an online bloggy type thing. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's <laughs> very oh, different. You mean it's a 21st century, century newspaper? Yeah. Well, no, no it's different no. than, it was, it's a different animal yeah, than no. what was budgeted yeah. for. Well, and the yearbook has changed, too. Um, okay, hold on a second. Uh, so we have so we have some of these things which are which are listed as vacant. Clearly, they're going to be filled. Like the, presumably the choral director of the musical, there will be one. Yes. The money's there. The orchestra production assistant. What is musical. that? Is that the musical? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So in fact, it's a very small three, list. Three out of and a, and a very very small amount of money. Um, the you know one of the questions that has been circulating around this group for a while is. Um, uh, whether there is an avenue for increasing flexibility for uh, offering new things without having to uh, go through what seems to be a very creaky and very slow process um, of approving a new activity, putting in the budget, blah, 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 blah. Um, I, I don't see, unfortunately, maybe not unfortunately, I don't see that the set of positions that aren't filled gives us that flexibility. It's not as though we have a, a list of 20 things that we keep budgeting for it that never get filled. And That's a very small have number. a process in the contract for doing that. And, and we'll yes, just leave it I was just, I was, then I was about to turn to Claire and say, Claire, these are dangerous waters, aren't they? <laughs> for the public who doesn't know, we're under contract negotiation. The extra p compensatory stipend schedule payment method um, how you get on the list, how you get off the list is all on the contract, which is... Okay. So we're not to going to entertain any more well, about that discussion. Go ahead. Yeah, the please. payment of the, the yeah, people, yeah. which I understand is under contract, um, not well, under contract, true, right? oh, what's in there? Not necessarily. Um, Shouldn't, wouldn't one think, putting the money and the process entirely aside, that the after-school activities should be decided upon, um, not in isolation, but with some sort of a larger scheme about what we'd like to see our kids doing after school, and shouldn't that be coming really from the educators, rather than on a piecemeal uh, basis either after the fact where we're being asked to fund something that or or before the fact in terms of the you know 
in terms of the contract negotiation, isn't it really in the best educational interest of the kids for there to be um, a more thoughtful approach? Let me interrupt for a second. I, it's not that there, I hear what you're saying, but, but in fact, I mean, there is a process that does intimately involve educators, and it's the process that gets us that list every year of, of new requests. Mm -hmm. Now, it's an imperfect process, perhaps. It's, a, it's not a process that says, you know, I'm starting, I'm going to build this program from zero every year and, and so forth. But it is, in fact, have educator input. We're, we're the very tail end of that. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I understand that, but I also wonder whether it's being driven by some sort of curricular or extracurricular vision rather than what always was. I, I just would love to see more precision on that because I think that the world is changing and to, to have this be part of, con to hear that this is really coming out of contract negotiations rather than out of some better plan for what's best for our kids is troubling. So I think if I, I don't want to uh, squelch this too much, but, I, but I, my recollection was that on the last contract go-round, there was an extra compensatory committee, which, uh, um, memorandum of understanding, which came out of it, which I might have thought would address some of those issues. I don't think it really did. I don't know whether that's on the table. Again, that's probably a very, that's probably way down the, the path, and no more should be said at this point. I think probably um, at, at this point, unfortunately, there just ain't much we can do about it. I, I could be wrong about that, and I would love to hear other people tell me I'm wrong. About can that. I just make an observation? And I don't really have an actionable thing. I guess what struck me on this list was I hadn't realized how many of the items are things that I would deem to be curricular like department chairs and things that are really to do with the instruction yeah. of the mm -hmm. students. And it was a much higher number than versus extracurricular. And so, right, it's 150, 50 and 50 or something. I'm sorry, can you speak up? Sorry, it's, one, it's roughly 150, I think, 50,000 for clubs. 150 being $150,000 spent on curriculum, academic sort of positions, 50,000 on, um, Athletics and right. fifty thousand clubs. So, because that that also includes coaches' things, which aren't on this list. Okay. As part of extra mm -hmm. compensatory. Okay. It just I think, and again, I, not to delve into to that d department, but in in thinking about buckets of money, it seems like dividing this into a bucket that is curricular and a bucket that's extracurricular and a bucket that's athletics seems like it would be logical to help get at some of the questions that are being asked. But again, I'm not asking you to Thank comment you on your them. information. Right. Just <laughs> right. well, can I and that would be my, my, that was my <laughs> observation. So I'm just <laughs> that's contractual. Can I understand the process a little bit Good. better? So, so that so yeah I'm fine. What, what we're being told here, as I understand it, is that, that the, the 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 stipends and what they're going to go for is coming out of contract negotiations no, it's already rather it's, it's, than it's, it's, no, it's currently in it's the in, contract yes. Lauren. So if you want so to change it, it's contractual. Anything in the contract right. is part of negotiation. But it, it, let me just let me say one thing slightly different. Every year we are we are faced with um, a budget which contains all of these things, right? That's not in the contract negotiation. That's in our budget. Every year we are asked to add things to these, and we get to decide to do that if we want. That that's entirely within our purview. What's in the contract is what these positions get paid after we approve that they should be that okay, they should okay. be paid. My concern is that there may be that, that, that the positions are sort of written in stone in terms of what there was in the past, rather than looking at the looking at what kinds of and I'm talking about the activities. I'm not talking about sports and arts. Um, rather than looking at what would enhance our curriculum or what would integrate well with our curriculum or what might be the best thing for our kids to be doing after let school. Me ask, let me ask a question, because I, 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 I think I can get right to what you're asking. If we decided, Mr. Mr. Bliss, if we decided that for some stupid reason there should no longer be, uh, take my favorite activity, a GSA, 
can we just say no more no more of this no. or are we committed to it and if we're committed to it then how come we're not running energy which is also on there because we don't have a good method for in the contract and so I'm gonna say for adding and deleting mm -hmm. clubs well, activities mm -hmm. curricular stipends except for there's some process deleted energy from being offered this year even though it's there as a stipend right well, right just like just like we have lots of other clubs and activities that fall below this list that aren't even getting paid mm -hmm. that to your point Lauren are probably some of those things that whether it's the administration or the students or parents believe it's good for kids to participate. Okay, so yeah, now we've both spoken but, for Lauren. Now but I, I'm going to speak for Lauren. Ahead, the please. reason why the newspaper isn't happening is because there wasn't a teacher who wanted to do it. And instead we have a teacher who's doing it in a different way, maybe getting paid, maybe not getting paid, I don't know. It, I am extremely troubled by the idea that this is not coming from a vision, I have a, I have, so if we, if, if, if it was thought and it was deemed that it would be a great thing for us to, to do model UN, and we don't. Let's say our social studies to teachers felt this would, there would be no way to do it for three years until the next contract negotiation. That's extremely but there is, So we just sent out <clears throat> on November 1st, we send out notification from the central office to all faculty and staff um, that they can bring forward extra compensatory considerations. We convene a committee. Uh, the committee meets. There'll be recommendations. Could be Model UN. Could be that someone wanted that to, you know, it's, it's been running maybe for a couple of years. No one's been paid for it. The faculty member who's sponsoring it wants it to be considered for a 2.0 ratio, whatever it is. The committee meets, votes on that, the, our internal committee, and then it comes to the regional school committee. And that's where it kind of gets tough because that always comes before this body at the exact time when this body's struggling with impending budget we may issues. We have things that are getting funded at the same time that may be no longer are relevant to the... But you raise a good point. It's, it, this, so students subscribe for this. So this a, we have a student activities fair mm -hmm. and students will sign up for them so it isn't as if we have something running for which is no membership. You know, so students are voting with their feet, as it were, to sign up for GSA or this mm -hmm. or that or the other thing. So to that, to your partially to your point, there's it's definitely student so but can I interrupt, can I interrupt for a second? Target. Steve, yeah. right on that point. So I because I really don't know the answer to this question, we all should, which is let's say again, and I'll just pick on it, let's say that we decided in a particular year, despite that it was highly unruly, the GSA shouldn't be offered. Can we do that? So the way we understand administratively is that everything that's there that's in the contract, which is everything here, gets posted for an advisor every year because we have to put, put it to post that available <coughs> because it's in the contract. So it gets posted. Whether students then sign up for it is whether it is the determining factor. So we can't. So we can't, is the that's answer. Okay. That's, and that's, and that's, that's, and that's, and so, that's so, what we say and, when we talk about yeah. the, the structure of our current contract yeah. and being Hold on a second. no I, let language just, in let there this to add it. So let's say that in fact, and now if I look at the energy advisor, that means that it was posted, that there was a fair, and nobody showed up? Or two <coughs> people showed up? And who decides what that threshold is because we've never had that conversation john do you want to speak we to did not have any signups for that let's say that two people show i don't want to put you on the sure. spot because i want to put you on the spot sure. uh let's say that two people show up do we have to offer it what who decides on that threshold? there there's nothing that they would say you have that this club has to have 10 students enrolled before it runs Kind of like we do with professional development. If we're sponsoring a PD institute and we're paying a stipend to an instructor to teach a course on, you know, yeah, yeah. Google, um, but that's we require, not a contract, and this is we so. require there be ten right. participants in that institute. So to Claire's point, at the moment there's a lack of definition around thresholds. Okay. That's such. that's where I was confused, and now now I understand why I'm confused, yeah. Michael. For so. If we could have a similar list of either the non-compensated 
activities at this time or ones that are privately funded or whatever that would that would be helpful but you started to talk about the budget process and and I'd extend this I think it's the same way with athletics we always get the incremental or the thing on the margin or the new thing and it's always presented us in an environment where it's just that item and it's not a do we have a collective approach over everything that we're doing maybe it's an every other year review or once every three year review or something that keeps this fresh and relevant and connected to curriculum and what what the administrators and the buildings and teachers or department heads think again speaking to Lauren's piece we should be putting energy to it today. I don't think it should always be up to the students to vote with their feet I think sometimes you need to nudge them because we think it's the right thing well, that's why it, that's why I said to partially to Lauren's point is this so the students have a voice is it is it necessarily with the the thrust behind it curricularly not at the moment a good, quick oh, comment okay. and I'm going to say I, something okay, and then I'm just, I don't know I mean on the stipend of things that are part of the budget I would love to believe that, be, be, that because we have a tendency to do what we've always done I would um, like to believe that um, you know administrators perhaps the principal perhaps some group of people who are trying to think in terms of the future of what would be good for kids to be doing not what they're going to vote with with their feet on and have some group of, of, of activities that are that are by design for the kids to do that are decided upon by the right people and I don't know certainly the principal would be one of them probably the chairs of the departments that would that would integrate with the program which would be so that it doesn't become what ki kids want to do this in the afternoon this is what they're going to do rather than we should have a French club or we should I mean so part of or we that, should have or good schools have, GS, yeah. have GSA you raise a good point, Lauren. Part of it, I think, is that there's a mounting um, level of frustration, maybe, among the faculty members, and it's not directed at, it, it's more about the process. So in other words, they will go and they'll run something for a few years, and then the, the lack of definition <coughs> around how things are get added, and then year after year, regional school committee members who have been, they know every next month, we'll have a list of recommendations from that committee and really will be in a position not to really do much about it um, at that time. And that's no one's that's no one's fault. So I wonder on to the faculty members how much desire there is to kind of go down that road when year after year it's really perceived as being incredibly difficult to get something out of it. But that's because we've right? got I sacred mean, cows here. I mean, maybe if the whole thing was blown open and it could be discussed as okay. a... Right, that's okay, and that's good. If, if I can, Claire, just one point of clarification. So it's your understanding that if we wanted to actually remove from posting GSA advisor again, picking on this, that would be a matter of a contract negotiation item, not an uh, administrative decision. The removal isn't. It's the, the way the contract's written. The appendix exists, and those are the stipends. Mm -hmm. There's no way to add or delete. There's no language in the contract that allows adding and deleting or a method for adding and deleting. So when you look at other districts' contracts, they may have a process in there by which a committee meets, vets, has whatever discussions go on, and the next year certain things are offered or not offered. Independent of the school committee? Uh, various, so various different ways different of doing it. Yeah. In our contract has not that much. And, and didn't we raise this concern before negotiations got started back in July? Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm a little, so. For all we know, it may okay. be, in fact, a, a topic it's of conversation. There, discussion going okay. on about there are many things. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're, we're ready to move on, I think. Um, I guess one last question. Please. Since we had fresh faces in the buildings, do you have any comments in general how this compares to? Your past experience is it? Yeah, I can yeah. tell you that we have about 12 to 14 groups that are running right now that are not in the contract, yeah. that have very high memberships that our students are very interested in, and that right now are not listed in that appendix. Yeah. And I, I yeah. would, my own opinion would be 
I do think it's time that we really looked at it and probably made some shifts because we probably do have <coughs> some new clubs and activities and opportunities that would probably be much more fitting for what our student population and for our school moving forward. And I know in the past district I was in, there was a lot more flexibility. There were some clubs that after a few years disbanded and others went before a board and they got more or less certified and it was, I think, a lot more responsive to the needs of kids. It was a, it was a pretty easy, I think, system in which kids were yeah. able to think of clubs and get okay. approved. In which district was that? In Norway. No. Norway. Norway. Karen, did you want to know? I, I think the, the point is that it all needs to be negotiated, which gets back to Claire's point. Um, in the conversation that, that you're currently having, we'll be able to have conversations about maybe shifting this. But in my previous district, a process was put in place to do exactly what Bernie had mentioned. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm just curious whether, is there any accountability? I see all of these committees that uh, number of participants. Uh, you know, not available, not available. Oh, is anybody overseeing all of this? Oh, no, no, that's most of those are the first department, the math department, department head is, is the first NA on that applicable. list. It's, it's not applicable. It's not, not available. No. It's, it's not an individual job. So if you're a department chair of the science department, Lane, it's not, you're overseeing the department. But you automatically got the $7,678. You're overseeing the yeah. department. And really, to, yeah. to Dana's point, that doesn't involve kids directly. Right. right. The, right. Kids. the list of these. Right. The list of these that are actually after school programs compared to the 12 or 14 that are running that are not on this list is a pretty small number. No, there is an NA next to musical, which, which we wouldn't be know busy. because it's, they haven't signed up, but yeah. there is the middle school year. one. There is the middle school one and there's not a number. Okay, but. we're gonna move on. Um, special items, new business, FY15 budget discussion. Let the games begin. Mm -hmm. Mr. Blake, did you want to introduce this? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> So we have been meeting with Mr. Smith, with Mr. Kellett, with the administrative teams. We've been meeting with the um, special ed director of the region. We've been meeting with the administrative groups, in fact, at each school. And we are really approaching budget building um, sort of a, a ground zero. And really saying, what do we really need for next year to continue to offer a level service configuration with deployment of personnel in a responsible manner. Uh, not to suggest that we haven't done that before, uh, but uh, we have an initial run of budgets for each of the three school districts. At this point, we'll, over the next few days, we'll be finishing the Sherborne, the Pine Hill budget, as a matter of fact, because we go before next week with the Sherborne School Committee uh, with a run of, of their budget. So. It's an, it's, an, it's an enormous amount of work. So we had an initial pass with the administrators. We're going back for another budget hearing. We're bringing both headmasters together later this week, Mr. Smith, Mr. Kellett, uh, to do another run through. One of the challenges we face uh, is that as enrollment begins to decline and there are some pockets of, of decline at the, at the middle school, we are faced with the challenge of needing to deploy faculty members across both schools, or potentially we may be there. And one of the topics that that's going to raise is the schedules between the two schools. And uh, that is, is fast becoming a, a hot topic administratively. Um, because if we're in a position where we're able to keep a program in place at the middle school completely the way it is, we're not talking about uh, fracturing the program at all, but we do have excess human resource capacity in order to be able to deploy that person to the high school. That becomes very difficult when you have two school buildings whose schedules are not married. Um, and that will be one of the greatest challenges for the region. I mean, it will begin in fiscal 15 and it will get more difficult as the years continue. That's just the nature of, and when you're talking about potentially having to lift particular positions and those people can then exercise bumping rights across this district, which is two school buildings, uh, it becomes a really interesting schema. And what we do is we continually run them on whiteboard scenarios in our offices. What happens when this happens? What, ha what if, what if, what if? That's what we've been engaged in now for, for a couple of weeks. So Steve, that 
schedule alignment issue touches on the two big things that we always hear, uh, the lunches yeah. and the, the whole middle school versus junior high philosophy, right? Yeah. So and it, it, it's probably going to come down to an issue where, you know, the lunches to a, to a lesser extent, I mean, we will probably wind up not having pure middle school and high school lunches, but have to have a hybrid lunch um, will probably become a reality. Uh, we're not going to be able to have the luxury of just being able to say, okay, if we have a portion of a position here and we need to keep that person whole and we have a need at the high school, if we're looking to do that, we need to be able to uh, have people moonlight between the buildings. So we're going to put six, seventh, eighth graders with twelfth graders at lunch. Um, in the process. Of okay. And I, it's, an, it's an important discussion in many facets. Yeah. You, you brought it up here, and it's, and it's important to know it's coming down the road. When do you, when are you when do you is this the discussion you wanted to have, or did you want? To no, I, do, I think it's important to raise an awareness of the ex, the extent of the work that's going on administratively. But some of the things that I, I I think sometimes at the regional level we think these are things down the road. All these things aren't down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these things are, are going to be in effect for the next fall. Um, so, so the business of uh, the business of the the alignment of the schedules, decision about the lens schedules, is I think fundamentally a school committee decision. Mm -hmm. I presume that what you guys are doing is looking at options. the issues, the options, yeah. and are going to come to us with a, a recommendation. Mm -hmm. right. It may be that we would be foolish to ignore that recommendation, but we also need to make sure that we're listening to our constituents, thinking about all of these issues ourselves. So the question is, when, when do you foresee needing to do a, an actual, we need a decision from the school committee on that issue? It is still, we need the benefit of, a, of another week and a half or so be able to continue to run scenarios, but it, it, it yes, the schedule decision may reside here, that's, that's fine. Uh, part of the issue will be the fact that people, there needs to be an awareness around what happens with all the riffing scenarios and bumping rights, because that is something administratively we have to carry out. It's a contract that we have to execute administratively. We have to live within the four walls of it. So knowing exactly what happens when, when RIFs are invoked, um, and that's just not riffing. That's just in order to make sure we're really fully deploying um, staff. Um, so over so, the next couple of weeks. So, so then in December, at the December meeting, it sounds as though we should plan to hear a presentation from you about the implications yay or nay, yeah. and then to make a decision on that, or decide whether we're not ready to make a decision on that, but I hope we would come prepared to to listen. I, I, I speak, at least for myself, and I expect for other people, that um, if at all possible, any presentation on that should arrive not on the, the Friday before, the way that the normal packet does. I think we're going to need some time to, to dig into it and think about it. So as much lead time as you can give us on that. It's a major decision. Um, and certainly the, the, you know, the input of you guys um, is going to be important as well as we think about it. And the input of our parents. Uh, sure. It, it's, if it comes in December, it's going to come in tandem with the FI 15 budget. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we'll be able to see if we take option A, what that does to the budget, yes. option B, what does to the budget. Mm -hmm. It's um it's in a way a lot cleaner at the elementary schools obviously mm -hmm. uh, they have nuclear districts that don't have multiple schools mm -hmm. um, so it's pretty clean that, in that way um, and we're making great progress with those budgets in terms of having them come in uh, in a in a very responsible manner uh, because it's it's just that way you know. Mm -hmm. And it could be that the impact for the region, once we do all the sort of massaging of everything, it could be the impact is not as great for, for the 14, 15 school year. That would be great. Uh, but certainly ramping up mm -hmm. moving forward. We've talked about schedule alignment and whatnot. Mm -hmm. this, this committee yeah, definitely yeah, sure. about mm -hmm. it. Um, mm -hmm. So, and I, I don't know if that's Scott, John, anything? <laughs> no, I think it's something we have to. Yeah. We have to look at how we have currently have shared staff, staff and that's yeah. raised some difficulties. Mm -hmm. We've been able to overcome them, but as you get more and more staff members, 
becomes more and more difficult mm -hmm. to overcome those. Mm -hmm. And, and that naturally can create more constraints on high school schedule, which is already constrained. Yeah. And, and then are there any other regional districts that have moved towards aligning their schedules with the middle school, and how's that worked out? Yeah, that actually would be nice. Yes. Be nice. Yes. There may not be any other. I mean, I, I don't know. There's not. It is worth it. Scan it to share the campus. It's going to be someplace else. What is it? Scan it. Up. Scan it. Up. One of the box towns. Okay. Um, Mask on it. Uh, oh, it's, it's that's, a, that's a preview. Is that the preview you wanted to get? Or did we sidetrack you on that? Okay. <laughs> um, so in December, we will see what? Yes. You will see a fiscal 15 budget presentation complete with uh, staffing implications mm -hmm. and scheduling implications. And, and that's now. first pass. First pass. We'll yeah. approve it that night and mm -hmm. have a budget hearing in January and we shall go home. Okay. Um, the. Uh, which brings us to, in fact, agenda items for December. Well, so much for that. That's what we're going to talk about. Um, Chinese, was that going to come up in December? That probably will come up in the, con I think I'd have that in the notes. That yeah. will come up in the construct. Okay. Uh, so is part of the budget. Well, hopefully the IMA as well, because yeah, we'll okay. be looking at capital items. Yeah. I was going to say, put, yeah, add capital items. Oh, yeah. Because um, I, the administration doesn't really know how many much to put in capital in uh, the operating mm -hmm. budget for some improvement items yeah. mm -hmm. um, and also do we need a notice of intent or whatever for Sherburn for capital I don't know what you guys um, are. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know what the I deadline can't what those on that dates is. Are. By the end of the year, we do. So right. So we'll, we'll we have to we'll do be that at right. December, December 5th. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Dover yeah. Capital coming, wants coming to know to meet their deadline soon after. We have to work right in the summer. And we also have to do the town report for Sherburn. Do we do that for Dover report. too? That's also the end of the year, I think. Yeah. So uh, we really only have that. We only have that first week in sh in December uh, because the Sherburn warrant opens, and then I believe it, it opens on the right at the beginning of December and ends at the end of that week. So we'll have to file an intent uh, immediately after the next regional school committee with respect to capital. Mm -hmm. Lady, I'm looking to you. That's right. Yeah. I think I have the memo from Sherman Valley. Yeah. Yeah. Early January it closes. Although it can it can be reopened. The selectmen capable of reopening yeah. it at any point. If, if we get our ducks in a row in December, we should be. And Michael. I recollect that Chris or somebody saying that back in September we would be having a new OPEB report or something or something around longer term liabilities for December, or was I imagining? We're in a different meeting. <laughs> <laughs> We're not on that. So, or didn't we do, know, it, did we do an January. annual report, you know, with the auditors or something? I thought came around this time well, last year. This is, this year. is quite a, a lot. No, no, but I'm just saying. But I thought we had auditors. We had auditors in in I thought December of last year. We did. We did. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not hearing that. I thought we had at least auditors in last year in December. We had Jim Egger and the auditors in is he, is he part of our, uh, th we will check to we see whether check. that's true. And you're right, we tend to ask them the question, what about OPEP, and they tend to say. But, but would but we, we be on a cycle for an update? Yeah. I thought there was a in budget to have them right. done. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking at last year's, and we did get their oh, um, audit. And, and as a bullet, we asked for recommendation. And they, they, again, I think the last OPEB was in June 2010, so we should have had one done June 2013, I thought, based upon so we could accounting. Well, that's that was a little <coughs> okay. uh, Anything else? So town report, Steve, when Cheryl usually gets an email from the two towns asking for it, I don't think she has received anything on that yet. That's so it's a usually a December, December into January thing. Yeah. I mean that's when we do it. Is, yeah. is we do it after the December meeting. Um, okay, Ruby. Uh, <clears throat> moving on to meeting minutes. Yeah. Oh, thank you for reminding me. Two things, really. 
Uh, one is I promised you a set of uh, uh, agenda topics for the rest of the year, which I did and then forgot to send to you. Mm -hmm. I'll do it as soon as I get home, well, maybe tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing. And um, the second thing is um, uh, every once in a while I remember to alert you to meetings that I've been a part of or that Dan and I have been a part of. <laughs> Much more often I forget to. I'm going to try to remember that. Um, and please, if you think of something like that that you happen to hear is brewing up that I've forgotten to alert you to, just tell me and I will make it official. So, for instance, there's that thing coming up at Dover Town Hall. Claire's recommendation, a good one, was to simply post the meeting. We will post the meeting, and therefore you're all welcome. None are required to attend. Um, November 14th. November 17th? 14th. 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 Thursday the 14th. Thursday the 14th. And the purpose of that is? Dover asks us to come in and talk about oh, the recap FY13. Recap 13, mm -hmm. chat about 14, mm -hmm. forecast 15. It was nice. We did Open for the two weeks. Open the door. Okay. Yeah. 7.30. Oh, 7.30. Yeah, so um, and now we turn to the meeting uh, minutes from October 1st, Dover Sherwood Regional School Committee. Uh, I had one uh, thing. Why is it hard? No, you have the meeting for 7 o'clock. That's what you had sent out, Steve, for the 14th. <coughs> 7? That's what I, that's when you sent out the Google calendar, it was 7. And then it's definitely, then it's 7. Then it's definitely, and I'll check on that tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, so I'm going to change it to 7. Yeah, actually, now we started with uh, check on at 7. Okay, so I, uh, back to the uh, meeting minutes of October 1st. Uh, motion to accept. Oh, so moved. Second? Second. <laughs> okay. uh, any discussion? Um, I had one which is just not a, it's not a correction, but in the assistant superintendent report, it says beginning next year, the park will be administered instead of MCAS in grades 3 through 11. And that's true, right? I mean, that's just, okay. I don't know why that caught me bus, but, mm -hmm. but there it is. All right. It's Any, scheduled to be. Anything else? Did you? Uh, that's what you said back. Did yeah. you print any of the numbers in the capital committee report since it's pretty detailed? Uh, it I looked at that and assumed you guys would, would be doing <laughs> well, that. I just really no, I, I, I ran out. Somebody, yes, somebody I believe that was correct. Somebody pasted it in from, from a different, it's got a different font in it, so I assume that they're whatever. Okay. I, I, um, the, the Mac, non-Mac changeovers have yeah. kind of screwed up with the, the fonts. Oh, no, but that wasn't a, that wasn't a correction. I just no. assumed that, no, therefore, it. it must okay. be correct. But I didn't actually just oh, pull from whatever. No, I'm, 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 just I'm realizing not copying and pasting. Oh, okay. I don't know why the fonts are All right. doing well, that. I like Times New Roman. It's good to see it. Anything else on this? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And then we have uh, minutes to note from uh, Sherburn, September 10th to over September 17th. We have an enrollment report. Anything else on Can anybody's mind? Uh, there's something I've been curious on the enrollment report. Mm -hmm. So when you, in the green section, mm -hmm. you allocate out enrollment at the regional level for METCA students between Pine Hill and Chicker. We just keep them from the, the school that they actually attended because there was this okay. gaping hole in the. That's what, the okay, yeah. so that's where they they're matriculating yeah. up if they've stayed with us. Correct, and it's oh, right. right. If they right. stayed with us, that's my okay. Yeah. Okay. We just, never bring them in the later date, right? So that if we have classes with um, with no Mecca kids, we don't try to because they left for one reason or another. We don't try to bring in new ones. A few years ago, when Claire was appointed, we made the conscious effort to try, when we have seniors who are graduated, we try to fill those seats the following year with either K or 1, can be done in the first grade, largely because the achievement gap is uh, far less significant um, and in terms of it, historically, in, in the years past, we've accepted students in grades 3, 4, 5, 6, and you're, it's playing catch up. 
No, I understand, but I just yeah. noticed that there was attrition in some of these grades. It started with higher numbers, and you know, students, presumably Boston students, if they if they can, would prefer, especially they can go to exam schools, would prefer to do so for obvious have, reasons, or private schools, or if they can get a scholarship. So, so is it a historical artifact from years ago that there were just fewer children? In the Medco program at Pine Hill, than there was a chick there brain, or was some it capacity? Years we didn't, some capacity years we didn't issues. capacity issues, yeah. so some years we didn't take okay. incoming it's, students. It's a pretty significant discrepancy, at least with this report at the regional level. Certainly less so now at, the, at the, uh, the elementary level. Now, now they, they sort of the, they literally go on a fluctuating schedule. So if we have a seat open next year, uh, it'll go to chick brain. Following year, Pine Hill, they very much want all Medco kids. Okay, anything else? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, motion to adjourn? So moved. Oh, I'm getting into it. <laughs> Just trying to make a lively. Second. Second. All those in favor. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you.